David Peterson, the creator of Mouse Guard, and welcome to Creator Commentary for the third series of Mouse Guard, The Black Axe. This episode will cover the extras produced for the hardcover edition. Please feel free to follow along in your copy of the hardcover as I talk about the behind-the-scenes details, art notes, and my headspace as I go page by page of the extras. I'll start by saying that this book is bigger than my previous books, and all because of the extras. The issue page counts were the same, and the standard added pages for a hardcover collection like the end papers, title page, etc. remained the same. But we added an 11-page prologue, a 4-page epilogue, which 4 pages is shorter than my previous epilogues for fall and winter, but then also 11 2-page spreads of maps, extras, and cutaways. That's 22 pages in the extras alone, almost a full issue's worth of page count. Archaea was very kind to allow me to pad out this book so I could explore and make reference materials for the fans for all the major places we explored in this volume as I took the usual eight pages of extras up to 22. Jacket cover. A cover is meant to sum up the feelings of the contents of a book. And in this case, I needed to combine chronological points in the story to make that happen. Specifically, because I wanted Kelena to be holding the axe in a book titled The Black Axe. But as M was dead by the time Kelena was wielding the axe outside of Ildur, and Conrad was still missing until after M's death, it took some timeline fudging to get all three main characters on the front of this book. This marks Kelena's second collection cover appearance. He was also on the winter book jacket. And this marks the second time a trio has been the jacket cover composition. I subdued the location of Ilder Hall a bit more than I'd have liked, looking back on it now. It's very far off in the distance. I think I was wanting to leave a lot of clean sky area for the title of the book to be unobstructed. On the back side of the jacket cover is King Luthaban, with the tangled briar as his backdrop. The rough pencils for this jacket are dated September of 2012, and are pretty close to the finished artwork. To my surprise, looking back, it looks like I didn't use a photo of the model I built of Ilder to draw it into the background. PLC The PLC, or Printed Laminated Cover, is the real hardcover cover of the book. It was designed to be the cover image of the book M has throughout the story, and all the lore and history of the Black Axe lies inside. End Papers like the other books before, we used a toned-down version of the map for this volume on a faux parchment for the end papers. I'll talk more about the map specifics later. Title page. Like every other book in the main series of Mouse Guard, this is dedicated to Julia. However, there is a list of additional special thanks, which include real-life friends who inspired Mouse Guard characters, Jesse Glenn for Kenzie, Mike Davis for Rand, Emerson Jones for Liam, and Seth Mirsma for Kellenaw. When I was working on this book, a group of artist friends had a weekly art night gathering to help us stay motivated and connected and to show off what we've been working on or to get suggestion and critiques about parts of our work we were less than satisfied with. Jeremy Bastian, Nate Pride, Katie Cook, and Eric Lynch are all included in the thanks for their support through art night. Then we have the six pinup artists, Alex Scheichman, Sean Rubin, Duncan Fregredo, C.P. Wilson III, Shane Michael Vudari, and Mike Mignola. Mark Smiley is on the list because of his being first to agree to publish Mouse Guard when he opened the doors at Archaea for books other than his self-published comic, Artesia. And Terry Jones is included for writing his foreword, or afterward, depending on what printing you own. More on that in a bit. For the artwork on the title page, it's of Kellina smoking his pipe. The choice of character was easy for this book. Of course, it was going to be Kelena, but how to trail the image over to the right page took some thought. In the fall and winter books, I used leaves and snow, but I didn't have an environmental visual that would work here. I considered blowing flower petals, like from M's funeral, but decided instead to use the trail of pipe smoke. The smoke was inked using my thumbprint. I'd use a wet pen over my finger and thumb, lay down a few prints, and then repeat the process. Then I scanned the original inks and applied a color hold to the prints to make them lighter and smoky. Forward. In more recent printings, this has become the afterward, since 
I had a few fans who were reading Black Axe for the first time in this hardcover form complain that the foreword spoiled major plot points for them. When we were getting ready to put this book together, then Editor-in-Chief Stephen Christie told me to think about who I'd want to write an introduction. And he said, seriously, dream big. I said I could only think of impossible gets, Jim Henson, who had passed away over 20 years prior, J.K. Rowling, or one of the members of Monty Python, preferably Terry Jones, who co-directed Holy Grail, my favorite movie, and who studied medieval history. I lamented to Stephen that all of my requests were impossible, and he cut me off and said, we actually have a connection to Terry. He wrote the Labyrinth screenplay, and through our association with Henson, I'll see what I can do. I was blown away that Terry agreed to write the foreword. In exchange, I sent him the original artwork for a Monty Python and the Holy Grail-inspired piece I drew of them facing the rabbit. Years later, I was able to meet Terry in person at a convention. While his decline from frontotemporal dementia was apparent, it hadn't yet been publicly announced. Terry signed my personal copy of The Black Axe on his forward page. We then got into talking about Wind in the Willows. He'd starred in and directed an adaptation of it, and I was in the middle of illustrating my version for IDW at the time. He came by my table and looked through every illustration I'd done up to that point, and we had a delightful chat about talking animals in the English countryside. Spot illustrations. Throughout the book, between sections, are some vertical spot illustrations. Before the contents page are the leaves. After the prologue are the flowers. Before the epilogue is the ivy and leading into the extras is a tangle of briar. Usually I only have three of these spot illustrations per hardcover, but this one needed four. And the briar and flowers point to specific scenes in the Black Axe, specifically the fox battle and M's funeral, but I needed more nature reference for the others. The ivy on the tree may connect to the ivy-covered secret entrance Kalana uses in Chapter 5 to get into Lockhaven, but the leaves connect to nothing visual in this story. The only time we ever see leaves are the birch leaves at the end of chapter one and the staghorn sumac leaves around the port city. But as leaves have been prominent as a visual cue for Mouse Guard, it's fine to have them here at the start of the book. Prologue. This prologue was originally published as an 11 page free comic book day story in a combined Mouse Guard Dark Crystal offering from Archaea in 2010. I'd considered holding it off to include it in a later Mouse Guard volume, but Stephen Christie convinced me that it would be right at home in The Black Axe. I'd always considered this story to be a failure as a free comic book day story. It worked well as a prologue, but as a story meant to welcome in new readers and satisfy old fans, it kind of does neither very well. It was right after this that I decided to do the more fairy tale style free comic book day shorts, because of how much fun all the guest creators were having with Legends of the Guard. Page 1, Panel 1. Spring 1153, an opening line slash title that will haunt me forever, it seems. Fans have been asking after the fall and winter books when they'd get spring 1153. I'd responded so many times and in interviews that I'd never do a spring 1153 story because I don't want every moment of these characters' lives to be documented. Or so action-packed that they'd need to be chronicled. Instead... I'd tell them that I'd eventually get to a post-winter story where we'd catch up to Liam as the Black Axe, but that many years would have passed in between winter and that story. So I did this story to show what does happen in that season. A lot of rebuilding and maintenance, which could be easily covered in 11 pages. Only to have a large amount of the fan base think that this was the first 11 pages of a much larger story. I always associate spring with rain and mud, rather than the visuals of flowers and new life. So, I opened the story with raindrops forming rings in a puddle. All of the rain on the next 11 pages were done by drawing black raindrops and trickles and splashes on a piece of paper laid over the original page art. It was then scanned separately and inverted so that the rain became light streaks and drops. The narration here, six days before day and night are equal, means about a week prior to the vernal equinox by our human measure. Panel 2. While Gwendolyn is sitting at her desk keeping a journal, she's also wearing the dress that she received from Saxon in the epilogue of winter. 
To soften the look of the sleeves and skirt, I did a color hold of all the interior fold lines. Panel 3. To switch up the visuals and start the transition from inside Lock Haven to out in the territories, I framed this panel with the reader outside the rain-pelted window looking at a warm and cozy Gwendolyn. The reference to the rivers and streams overflowing is another nod to my perception of spring, as well as to reinforce the idea of mice being very small in a very big world where even simple natural acts can become catastrophe for the guard. Panel 4. This vertical panel references back to the vertical panel at the end of fall, when Gwendolyn watches as her guard mice go out into the territories again. Here, the angle is different, as she watches out over the landscape, waiting for everyone to return. Page 2, Panel 1. I opted to start every page of this short story with a slice of the map to reference where each group was. In this case, I chose an odd point of the map where our focus is on an open section, with every other map mark surrounding our character's apparent location. Panels 2 and 3. The mention of rebuilding here isn't just a reference to this tree, because the only way to fix that would be to harvest the lumber from it, but to repair the marked and planned pathways after the rain and mud have changed the safest routes for travel. Here we have guard mice Cedric and Annika, pathfinding for the guard. Both characters have their most prominent appearance on the cover of the first edition role-playing game. Cedric was named after Cedric of Ratherwood from the old Defender of the Crown game I played as a kid, and Annika is named after the owner of the art supply store where we'd have art night. Panels 4 and 5. Fans were excited about wolves at the end of fall, and I thought showing them here would be good fan service, a fun predator to draw, and also a way to show that the spring rains have opened up the territories for large beasts to roam in. I drew this story prior to the Black Axe book with Kellanaw dealing with the aftermath of the fox's kits. I think drawing this scene of the wolf pups drinking water may have seeded that story point in my mind. In the last panel, it may be hard to notice, but Cedric and Annika are tiny silhouettes atop that stone, looking down on the path of the wolves. Page 3, panel 1, takes us to Rootwallow. Panels 2 and 3 where we find Cerise and Sela, mice based on my sisters Kirsten and Lisa, helping to harvest green onions and some kind of red berries. The word Cerise is a shade of red, Kirsten's favorite color. Seriously, folks, she buys her appliances and towels in red, too. And Sela is an anagram of L-E-S-A, which is the unusual Danish spelling of my sister's name. Gwendolyn's narration mentions Liam's disappearance three moon cycles, or about three months ago. This is a direct reference to Liam departing at the end of the winter book. Panel 4. The two mice pulling the wagon are meant to be town mice from a surrounding settlement, not guard mice. And while Cerise and Sela helped harvest the goods on the transportation leg of the task, they are there as protection. Page 4. Panel 1. On to White Pine. Panel 2. I think I wanted a beat panel here just because of how well the three panels below all fit into vertical shapes, so I needed something here and went for a wooded landscape in the rain. Panels 3 through 5. Walden and Ewing are chopping down some timber. These guard mice also feature on the first edition role-playing game hardcover. Walden is the one using the block and tackle to keep the tree from falling prematurely as Ewing chops at it. I also rigged up an impractical rope hanger to keep each end of the now fallen tree supported as they use a huge crosscut saw to get it into manageable pieces. I remember seeing demonstrations of this type of saw being done at a few living museums I visited as a kid. And in the last panel, the duo float the lashed timbers down a flooded stream. As for Gwendolyn's narration, I wanted to make sure it didn't seem like Gwendolyn was heartless about finding Liam. Just practical. Page 5. Panel 1. Back to Lockhaven. Panel 2 is the panel where the apiary keeper and his smoke sensor are. In terms of page flow, this is a bad arrangement for knowing where to go next in the panel sequence. The apiary keeper from Fall is also shown on the first edition of the role-playing game cover, although... He makes a pretty prominent appearance in Fall, Issue 6. 
I've talked more about the inspiration for him and his bees atop Lockhaven back in the fall creator commentary. Gwendolyn's narration of Liam being with the guard for 13 seasons, or a little over three years, harkens back to his joining around the end of the Weasel War of 1149. Panels 3 and 4. Inside the apiary, we see Saxon and Sienna ready to harvest honey. The balcony and awning outside is the same one we see the apiary keeper standing on in Fall Chapter 6. I needed to pair Saxon with someone. And since it couldn't be Kenzie, we'll see why in a few pages, I opted for a character shown and mentioned in the Winter Book as well as the RPG cover, Sienna. She is based on Jesse Glenn's sister, Anne. In the RPG, I'd shown Sienna in a beehive for her portrait illustration, which is what inspired this scene. The apiary has a small fire to keep the place warm since the one balcony wall is open to air, Presumably, this is boarded up or tarped off in colder months, allowing the vents above to allow air in and the smoke out. In the corner next to the buckets is a pile of pollen, with a shovel in it. I guess the guard mice harvest more than they need, so the bees have enough to produce extra honey all year. To draw the hexagon pattern of the honeycomb, I took a digital pattern and warped it in Photoshop to mimic the contour of this hive section. After the page was inked and ready for color, it was a big job to isolate all the honeycomb inks for color while avoiding all the bees, ropes, cages, etc. The dripping honey was a separate color hold that took some work to isolate too. The narration of Saxon knowing about Liam does refer to Saxon having seen Liam departing from Lockhaven at the end of winter, and it will tie in with the epilogue of this book too, though that does take place chronologically after this scene. Page 6. On to the scent border. Repouring the scent border are Vincent and Aaron, two mice that feature on the cover of the first edition RPG. And watching their progress is Elemis, a guard mouse based on Mark Smiley, the founder of Archaea. I built a wooden model for the barrel carrier, as well as a Bristol board barrel to sit in it. I did this as much as an exercise in needing it for drawing perspective reference, as I did to simply design something two mice could carry a barrel in. I photographed the model with some old sculptures I'd made of Liam, Sadie, and Kenzie to help me stage some various panels for this page. I rarely ever use those sculptures as stand-ins for drawings, but in this case, the scale of them matched the barrel carrier, and it helped me get some quick visual ideas. While working on this commentary, I found a few alternate photos that I didn't use. The tap in the barrel is in the side, which allows that fluid, which is a concoction of various predator urines, glands, and other plants and natural bits, to flow off the side of the path where the barrel carriers will walk. There is not a physical border everywhere along the scent border, and even where there is one, like here, it's not meant to keep predators out but to be a visual for the mice so that they know where they should not travel beyond. Gwendolyn's narration about the summit is a continuation of the agreement in the winter epilogue to have more diplomacy between the major towns and the guard to help protect all of mouse kind. In this case, also with a new group of mice wishing to join the guard, and like Gwendolyn states, start a life purely of service, an idea I was trying to push harder since the glory of being a mouse warrior kept coming up when promoting the RPG. Page 7, Panel 1. On to Lily Grove, or Oak Grove, or one of their shores. Panels 2 through 4. In Panel 2, Sadie and Kenzie are working together on this very odd winch that seems to be permanently attached to this branch, and by Panel 3, we see that it has a rope that leads down to the stream or lake. By together plugging peg into hole and pulling it forward, the two mice will be able to raise that winch, even with some weight on the end of it. And by the last panel, we see that they are fishing. Why? Mice don't eat fish. Perhaps they use them to stink up the scent border brew? Well, as you know if you've read this story, is that it as well as several other of the animals and harvests in this story are used as an offering. 
The narration of Gwendolyn is unrelated to this page and mostly is about the loss of Kelenaw and what that loss symbolizes. The last panel's text leaps forward to that idea's logical conclusion of not wanting to surrender something special they've grown accustomed to. Page 8, panel 1. On to Grass Lake. Panel 2. Bastion and Delvin are the heroes of this page. They'd both been in Winter and the RPG. Bastion is based on Jeremy Bastion, and Delvin is based on Nate Pride. Panel 3. They are battling a giant snapping turtle. This was the first time I'd shown a turtle in Mouse Guard. And it was the image for the cover art when this story was released as a free comic book day story in 2010. I kind of think I drew the cover before I had the rest of the story's plot worked out. Not even knowing if this turtle battle was the whole story or just a small one-page scene like it ended up being. The narration mentioning too large was strategic for this panel, with the framing showing the scale of the mice to the turtle. I was inspired by the cave troll in Fellowship of the Ring, peppered with arrows and still a lumbering hulk of an opponent. Panel 4. We leave off the action with Delvin about to lose his shield. Because of the later pages, we know that they ultimately defeated the turtle, but I like the idea of leaving the audience hanging for a bit. The narration is purposeful here, too. The focus on being too big of a job for one, as Delvin is framed alone fighting against the beast. Page 9, Panel 1. On to Dory Gift and Gill Pledge. Panel 2. Fagin, Irwin, and Pierce, guard mice from the first edition RPG cover, are rushing towards a burrowing something digging in the base of a tree and a mouse settlement. I'm not sure where this is exactly, Gill Pledge or Dory Gift, but I like that the architectural details look a little fairy tale ish. Panel 3. A badger has gotten through the lower gates. You can see a broken round hobbit hole style door smashed in the dirt, and the badger has a mouse in its mouth. Gwendolyn's narration mentions a few things her being young for the role of matriarch, and declaring war on another species which is what the Weasel War is all about. Panel 4. Like Bastion and Delvin on the last page, this conflict doesn't resolve when the scene ends. It's merely ramping up to the high point of action in the combat. Fagin, Irwin, and Pierce are still alive, but the mouse seen in the mouth of the badger has been released and lies dead on the soil. Page 10. Panel 1. On to Ferndale, or the area where Ferndale used to be. Panels 2 through 5. Two hares, towing a cart loaded with so many of the elements we saw harvested in the story. Fish, the badger, the turtle, honeycomb, green onions, berries. Perhaps even the cart was made from the timber on page 4. And they're in a landscape dominated by ferns. The hares, Isabel, the guard mouse from Winter, based on my sister-in-law Ashley, they drop off the cart outside a stone-framed den and then depart quickly. To make panels 3 and 5 so similar, I just copied my pencils from panel 3 over to panel 5, slightly enlarged, and then hand inked them separately to avoid it looking like a digital copy job. The enemy Gwendolyn is referring to on these pages is not the reveal of the bear on the next page. It just serves as a metaphor. The real thing she's fighting against is apathy, dissent, disharmony, infighting, and a lack of compassion. Page 11. A slow reveal as the bear comes out of hibernation to this offering. The offering being a tie-in with the line of placate from Gwendolyn's narration. In the prehistory of Mouse Guard as a book series, when I was making the transition from a story called 1149 to it becoming Mouse Guard, I decided that the largest animal that I would include would be a bear, and that the smallest would be a mouse. This page was a fulfillment of finally getting to set that upper size limit. Since Ferndale now falls outside of the scent border, I think it's safe to say that this bear is not in the territories, and that this offering is symbolic more than necessary, and that while it hasn't been mentioned prior, or since, not even in the RPG, that perhaps this is a yearly ritual, whenever there is a bear nearby. The hero Gwendolyn is hoping to believe in as a symbolic hero to unite mouse kind, is the Black Axe, or someone like him, 
which is what comes next chronologically. Liam with the Black Axe. Epilogue, page one. Liam narrates as he lies out under the stars. I used a different font for Liam's narration than I did for Gwendolyn or Kelena. The point of this epilogue was to explore some missing pieces about the axe that I'd neglected to fill in or had overlooked throughout the Black Axe series. Most importantly, the way the axe went from Ben to Merrick, and then how both went to Ilder. But since there wasn't a living mouse that I could have Liam meet to tell him all of that, I decided to do it with a ghost-like vision, and it takes the form of a crow, M's familiar and the species present in the territories as well as on Ilder, a species who could know those details. The inks for this page were very simple. Everything seen in ghostly white or blue was a black ink line on the page. The rest was left blank, and everything was adjusted in the coloring stage to make the line work ghostly apparitions rather than unfinished drawings with no backgrounds. Page 2, Panel 1. The stoat shown here is the same stoat on the fourth cover of Legends of the Guard, Volume 2, which, according to that cover's legend, did not die at the hands of a mouse. Panel 2. Ben, in a time of crisis, looked to a mouse who would get revenge. And this is the kind of revenge only personal pain and hurt can generate. Not revenge on that one stoat, but on all weasel kind. That idea was really just an excuse to get Merrick across the sea, where I had already established in King Luthabin's tale that he had arrived and died. The transfer here of the axe is being done like a royal knighting ceremony, but also reminiscent of the images from the Adana tapestry seen from M's records. Panel 3. The visuals for this story needed to be succinct. This is a parable. So three graves, the closest with an anchor on the headstone, are on the foreground shore with Ben as Merrick's ship departs. Not because those three mice were buried right in a row so close to Merrick's departure point, but because I could load the visual to match the tale. Merrick, which is a form of Mark or Marcus, which originates from the word Mars, means warlike. Panel 4. The Regret Panel. Ben realizes too late that he's either unleashed a monster with the noble weapon of his ancestors or that Merrick will fail and the axe is lost forever, meaning I'm setting up a reason for Ben to also end up on Ilder. Page 3, Panel 1. And how does Ben get across the sea? That was something I needed to figure out a rational explanation for, so I showed a larger bird, a pelican, delivering Ben to the ferret shore. A pelican isn't native to Michigan, where I try to set a lot of the animal species information, but I made an exception for something larger that could make a longer trek with fewer stops. And how did Ben arrange for bird transport? Well, Ben and M's fairer family line is the one that has Piper in it, as in Piper the Listener. The free comic book day story I wrote about the mouse who attempts to learn speech of all the animals? Piper would be Ben's aunt. I'm not saying that she specifically spoke to this pelican or that she'd even still be alive when this tale takes place, but with a family history like that, I have enough leeway to write narration like this. Panel 2. And perhaps there are other folks who have been willing to learn the speech of beasts, as I say here that Merrick has been talking to the animals on Ilder, something I'd showed the results of in Chapter 3 of this book. I'd like to think that Merrick doesn't speak any of those languages well, more like the growl voice Kelena does with the fox kits, hoping that they get the gist. Panel 3. It was important to me that Ben plead not with false promises or threat of violence from a pelican, but with compassion for mouse life. Unfortunately, it costs Ben his life, but by doing so, it shows you exactly where Merrick falls in those same terms. By showing who Ben was, I showed you exactly who Merrick wasn't. Panel 4. And there, on those distant rocky shores, the axe took Ben, for his bones to sit and wait for M and Kelenaw. Page 4, Panel 1. 
The moral of the story comes back as a crow to tell Liam the point of it all. I wanted to avoid blanket slogans like it matters not what you fight, but what you fight for, or anything about the greater good like I'd done in past volumes. Those slogans can be easily misinterpreted as the ends justify the means. So here I had the crow ask Liam to consider everything he's learned, to seek counsel, to weigh costs, to think about the effect of harm, and that the Black Axe doesn't grant him the wisdom or right to do with it all that it's capable of doing. Panel 2. And as Liam rises from the pine needle forest floor, he addresses the problem with an unreliable narrator, and answers that the moral gleaned from that tale is no less important if the tale proved to be false. And speaking as the writer of this tale, it isn't false, and the moral is equally as true map. I drew a new map for this volume. I took my original map sketch and then zoomed out, distorted it, and started replacing all the text and markings fresh in Photoshop. This way, like most old maps, it is similar to a later or earlier map, but different enough to be its own. While deciding on what symbol to use for the settlements, I couldn't decide on two. Uh, it looks like the village and the town. So I decided to make up a third so that I could just use all three and delineate the sizes of the locations with symbols. The font was a simple replacement, but I also moved around exactly where the dots and the text were for this map. I also made some spelling changes in a few places, adding an E to the end of a few locations. This is the first map on which I ever placed Ven, which is a nod to the surname of family friends. I had to include it here because Conrad references it back in Chapter 2. Because this story takes place before the Winter War, it also means that Woodruff's Grove, Ferndale, and Walnut Peck are all active and inside the scent border. The map is dated 1108, which is seven years prior to this story starting. And the rays on the map are meaningless other than that they radiate out from that crest symbol on the key that serves as a compass rose and as a hidden Haven Guild symbol. Axe Lore. A two-page spread of all the Axe Lore bits we've seen scattered in the book in one place for your reference. Rather than the stone tablet with the Axe's passing history, I decided to do an inverse of it as a stone rubbing on paper. The family tree overlapping covers up the names of Lyndon, Sarah, Brienne, and Dalton. But they are pretty clear when you see them in Chapter 6 that I gave myself some artistic license here to display the papers in a more interesting way. The Adana tapestry is shown in its most complete form here, showing the snakes who surround all that is causing death, the vulture carrying the souls of Ferrer's children to say in, and Ferrer forging the axe. The next portion shows the axe being transported to Lockhaven. Then the tapestry is torn, and the last scrap shows the part of the tale that was meant to be one of the big reveals in this book. The reason why it's torn, this has been a missing secret, that Ferrer remarried, had more children, and that the axe has been passed down for 200 years. In the early printings of this book, I'd made a mistake that we've corrected in the most recent reprintings of the Black Axe. The three Ferrer children, shown bundled up as babies on the Donna tapestry, are labeled Linden, Garrison, and Olaf. And if you look carefully at the family tree, you'll see that Garrison and Olaf spawn the line that eventually produces Kelena. I didn't study the family tree close enough when I was drawing this art to notice that the third child is actually supposed to be Sarah, who starts M's line. To fix this, I drew a new hand-lettered replacement name to digitally patch it in for the latest printings and to remove the suggestion of incest. But back to the mice passing the axe. I've been referencing this series of designs to draw every past black axe using these embroidered suggestions as the jumping off point for the costumes and personalities of the various past black axes. Sea and star maps. When I was making the maps and star charts for chapter five, showing the return voyage, I generated some designs I liked and hated relegating them to only one tiny panel. So here I got to show them off a bit. The map titled Lands of the Ebon Kingdom shows that it's made of several islands, with Ildur being the biggest. 
The Eben also means that these are the lands under the control of King Luthabin's clan. All of the names are Danish words. The major lands shown are Hein, meaning fence, Blomst, meaning flower, Litjors, meaning the little lands, Langjord, meaning long land, Heiren, meaning the heron's nest, and Sistikig, meaning the last look. The words on the lines and radius of the map note things like solid ice moon 10-4, meaning that the ice is usually solid enough to walk on October through April. Other notes are deep waters, 12 days, 40 days, Kong star line, and last route of Johanben, which is a nod to my first Peterson ancestor who left Denmark and came to Michigan, Johannes Pedersen. The star chart is also all in Danish. I created the rough for this by digitally drawing over some old map's compass rows. On that chart of stars are Dronning, which means queen, Orn, which means eagle, though I added an E to it, Blomstra, which means prosper or bloom, Kong, which means king, Goldjord, which means barren land, Hoberstian, which means hope star, Storkrau, which means large crow, Skal, which I don't think I translated, but tried to make sound like skull. Host, which means harvest. And Hyra, which means heron. A nod to the heron constellation the mice use, as shown in Legends of the Guard, as well as this volume. The Sea Journey map was my attempt to show that the return trip involved a great deal of island hopping and that their voyage out drifted them too far east to have seen any of those lands before the storm. There's also a tentacle squiggle along the red path, showing where Conrad took a stab at that squid tentacle. The Red Snapper A nice, isolated illustration of Conrad's ship, the Red Snapper. I was able to pull the model down off the shelf to use it as reference for one last illustration of this boat. I also wrote a little history of the ship and Conrad's father that I'd honestly forgotten about until I was rereading it for this commentary. Like that Conrad's father's name was Strom, which is a name that means stream or flow. Or that the ship was built in 1101 by the boat builders Kelton and Son. If that name is a reference to anything, I've forgotten it. The rest of the text just explains how a single mouse could sail this ship using the different lines under the aft deck. A ship of shell and timber scrap. Like the facing page, I was able to get the model back off the shelf to draw this hardcover extra. This boat hadn't been dry docked as long in my artistic storage since it was built and used in issue 5, but it was nice to have the model to rotate and find the angle I liked to showcase the boat for this illustration. And the info in the text box just reinforces everything I've mentioned in Chapter 5 Creator Commentary. Ilder Hall. I realize this is going to get repetitive. All of the extras in this hardcover were really just models I needed to take off my shelf again, I'm noticing. The Ilder Hall model was modular. There was the door section and half of the length of the hall's worth of floor and columns, but I had interchangeable roof sections, depending on if I was showing the front half or the back half. Because this was a full-length cutaway, I had to set up my camera on a tripod, set up the model for the front half, take a picture, and then move the hall section down the right amount and swap out the roof and the furniture and take a second photo. Then in Photoshop, I could assemble the two photos into one architectural reference image to draw from. With this cutaway, I wanted to draw attention to the fact that the dark sections in the side wings of the hall were tunnel entrances. I almost even labeled them in this diagram, but I instead went with just explaining it in the text box to the side. Included in the uses for the subterranean rooms is metalsmithing. I think I wanted to just have some world-building justification for their weapons and jewelry, but it makes me wonder about ferret mines, forges, and metallurgy. Lower Port Sumac. The model for Port Sumac, as I mentioned in the Chapter 2 commentary, was all made of commercially available papercraft table gaming kits I printed and assembled. They were then attached to a sheet of pink insulating foam using craft sticks to get the whole town up on stilts. Here's an odd little art note. There is a boat just above the word shipping in the text box that has a Viking longboat-like carving on the prow in the shape of a rabbit's head. 
I didn't mention it here, but I think in the mouse guard world, perhaps lower port sumac needs to be rebuilt or partially rebuilt every other year or so from the wreckage due to weather and flooding. I think I wanted to show some kind of steep stairway carved into the rock that would lead to the upper town, but I didn't do it for some reason. I wish I had. I think if I was going to redesign this town now, I'd not only stack the buildings on top of each other a bit more and make it all look a little more precarious, but I'd also add a way up to the upper level that is part stone carved steps, part wooden scaffolding to fill in where stone had worn away or crumbled. This spread also features a cutaway of the Mariner's Bell. The model was handy to have again, and basically already was a cutaway as it stood. I added in some details on the lowest level that we never see in Chapter 2, like that bar, which has an odd 90-degree angle corner in a supposedly octagonal building. Whoops. The bar has one giant barrel on the bar top. I assume this is like the house grog and then a few smaller barrels under the bar. This must be more specialized and pricey offerings. Above the bar is a collection of personal cups and tankards belonging to the mouse regulars. And reviewing this drawing again, I'm glad to see another entrance on the lowest level, just to the right of the bar. All you can really see of it are the bits of glass window and the covered porch slash dock leading off to the right. That is a nice out for me for the question, how did the barrels get down that stairway? Coincidentally, the building closest to that entrance would be the general store. In the top portion of the bar is the giant bell, which, as the text explains, was the warning bell up in Upper Port Sumac before a storm blew it down to the water's edge. I have to assume the M and Mariner's Bell Tavern text were etched or engraved after the bell was relocated inside this tavern as a novelty method for quickly clearing out the patrons at closing time. Upper Port Sumac. As I mentioned in the commentary for Chapter 6, the model reference for these buildings was kit-bashed using an assortment of various commercially available tabletop RPG papercraft kits I printed and assembled. I added broken branches from my backyard as visual interest for the town being built around the Staghorn Sumac. There was only one panel in Chapter 6 that I showed all three of these buildings, and only two that showed more than the tavern and the inn. So I thought it was nice to frame these in a way for the spread where the reader could get a sense of the exterior of Upper Port Sumac. As the text says, there's a lot more to this town down in the underground tunnels, mouse homes, shops, breweries, etc. It's only the tavern and inn, the storehouses, and gatehouse that are exposed. The opening in the center of the storehouse leads to the underground dwellings. The storehouses are for storing the staghorn fruit and drying it as it's harvested. The gatehouse is, I think, where the town crier watches both off the bluff for ships as well as any visitors coming in, friendly or otherwise, and then warns the town, not really so much to keep them out. Though that warning bell is clearly over the gatehouse. Perhaps that's a really long rope that goes underground and back up into the gatehouse. Roos Ale, as I mentioned in Chapter 2's commentary, it's a nod to the scientific name Roos for sumac. The Droop is the name of the tavern, which is a nod to the name of the fuzzy seed clusters Staghorn Sumac produce. For the cutaway of the Droop, I created a model photo collage. I made part of an interior version of the Droop separately, then overlaid a photo of it roughly at the same angle as my already made exterior model to make a cutaway guide for myself. That's because the exterior was already built and I couldn't really tear it apart and do the interior. On the wall inside the droop, there's an image hanging on the ground floor and it's a reference to a Paul Burthen print that Julia and I have in our stairwell and that I've done a mouse version of for a past sketchbook. Because the building was too narrow to be believable to hold the occupancy needed, I fudged by backing it against a grass-covered soil mound, where the ground and second floor rooms extend into. This is the clearest to see with the half door under the stairs on the ground floor and the two guest doors at the top of those same stairs. On the upper floor is a room with hammocks that explains three of the 11 mouse guests it can accommodate. The doors on the second floor that face out over the outdoor seating area 
are meant to be a storage room where the barrels of drink are brought in via that pulley arm. With the barrels above the bar level on the main floor, the ale taps flow due to gravity. I've drawn more of that bar area when I used the droop as a setting for the start of the free comic book day story Thane and Ilsa, when it's Sadie's mother who owns and operates it. Shorestone. The Shorestone spread is pretty straightforward, not much behind the scenes to tell. I think I followed the model a little too closely. The entire thing looks too clean, not just the architecture, but how it meets the landscape, like a, literally a model set down in a perfect spot, rather than incorporated with and becoming part of its surroundings. I think I meant for the roof to be made of copper, and it's green because it's oxidized. I wanted the roof to be made of metal so that all three of the manual labor disciplines were on display from the exterior, the stonework, the wooden vent windows, and a metal roof. But I also realized how impractical it would be for that much copper to be mined, refined, and hammered into shape. But who knows? These are the masters of these techniques, and perhaps mice of shorestone can manage. Like the Lockhaven two-page spread from Fall, I divided the smaller text boxes into four and made icons for the discipline sh in Shorestone, which also happened to be the same exemplified by the Haven Guild. So I had to use different iconography for each here, since I was going to repeat the concepts again in a few pages. Inside Shorestone. This was originally going to be the only Shorestone spread, but I knew I couldn't fit in all the material about the different disciplines like carpentry and smithing and fit in the feeling of this sprawling architecture. So I added the previous spread and the exterior to give room to do this one without visual interruption. The model for the interior of Shorestone is modular. Two hallway walls with one corner can be moved and arranged to keep making segments of the city that go on forever under the rocky landscape outside. A few of the signs and shops are a bit more visible here than in some of the cases in Chapter 6. On the lower left is Gibbs Seeds and Grains and Baked Goods, which is a nod to my grandfather Gilbert, whose nickname was Gibb, and my grandmother Doris, who was an accomplished baker. You can see baked goods displayed in the lower open arch to the left. Above there, you can see all different colored fluids and bottles. This is a reference to a sign that's not visible here, but you can see back in chapter 6 for an ink and stain shop. On the center section, we see the tavern and the book banners again, but with an as yet unseen larder banner between them. The corner banner, which we can't see here, but was in chapter 6, was the moon loom. Now, the next banner, as we go to the right, is Loom, Spool, and Die. Perhaps two textile businesses next to each other, or just one with two different signs. Either way, you can see the hanging textiles, a spinning wheel, and a loom in the upper corner arches. The knot and woodwork signs are here again too, and you can see ropes and pulleys in the open arch below, and the stacked lumber above. The flags hanging from the ceiling were momentarily seen in one panel of chapter 6, but for this spread, I needed to line the hall with many, many more. I'll address them from left to right. This first one, I'm totally unsure of its symbology or city affiliation. I'd drawn this as a border, I think with the help of a Google image search for some border patterns, back in the 2008 sketchbook to pad out two commissions I'd done that were taller than they were wide. The symbol could be a stylized fern pattern, but I'm reluctant to use this as Ferndale's flag before it fell. It seems too frilly. Perhaps it's an older and retired design from there. Next is the yellow one that has a cropped version of the Haven Guild symbol and is Shorestone's flag. I showed the mouse from Shorestone in the winter hardcover extras with a more colorful version of this flag. The next to the right is a pointed flag that I've decided is the banner of Woodruff's Grove. I only say that because more recently when creating a matted print of a fox watching outside a mouse settlement, I drew this flag on architecture I've already earmarked as Woodruff's Grove. The next to the right is another one I haven't given a home to yet. I originally drew it in a piece for the 2010 sketchbook, but I think I was basing it on existing real-world flags. 
Perhaps it's the flag of a long gone place, but I still reserve the right to use it for one of the known spots on the map if I so choose. As I referenced in chapter six commentary for this book, the center flag is a piece of the tapestry from Alec Scheichman's Legends of the Guard story, Oleg the Wise. Then is the flag of Copperwood, a city which was once called Oakwood, according to the Legends of the Guard covers. It's inside a large oak tree and extends to the copper mines below. The iconography was already shown in winter on its Mayor Firth's clothing. Next up is the purple crossed blooms. That flag is the one of Elmwood. The symbols are meant to be crossed elm buds blooming. Another symbol shown in the winter extras with its representative holding a similar banner with gold stitching and tassels. And lastly is the flag with the shield-shaped symbol. That's the flag of Blackrock. I used the case the Blackrock representative is holding in the winter hardcover extras as a starting point, but simplified the design just to be the shield with a star pattern inside. Haven Guildroom. This model was modular, which meant I could take off the walls and leave the columns in place. Since I only made two walls, one with the founders and one with the doors and cabinets, I needed to photograph this model twice while moving the cabinet wall into its other position to get a complete reference photo. Since this room is basically square, it only took up half of the two-page spread, meaning that I had to fade off the background art between the text boxes describing the Haven Guild founders. The main text box mentions the guild protecting artifacts other than farers. I don't know what those are, but it could mean that there's an adze or a saw or a level or a ruler belonging to one of the other founders. But that's the kind of story seating that allows me to endlessly play in Mouse Guard for future stories. I talked a bit about each founder in Chapter 6 commentary already, so I'll just mention a few things that the text brings out uniquely here. Omar was not the first mathematician slash architect mouse, but the most accomplished. I also like the idea that the Haven Guild could still be home to a massive archive of floor plans and blueprints for multiple major mouse cities. Cities both still around and long since gone because of Omar. For Ferrer, and I guess I do this with them all, I wanted to show that they were not just skilled at their trades, but pioneers in advancing it like a science. That they experimented with the materials and process in addition to being good with their paws at the work itself. Thurston's moving stone as little as possible theory came from my time at the architectural antique store, where we wanted to move the huge mantles, cabinets, stone details, and stained glass windows as little as possible. Once in and once when it sold was ideal, but occasionally pieces needed to be moved if the display space couldn't be easily refreshed after a piece sold. We always knew we were at risk for damage to the piece or uh, to ourselves with each additional move. For Locke, I added in that he and Thurston worked together in younger days because I saw wood and stone as being so integral to one another. It's also a pairing of red and blue as friends, a symbolic Saxon and Kenzie echo. Matriarch Chamber. This is the last model reference I had to re-photograph. Because the model was modular, I could remove one wall section to allow this view with the roof still on top. I chose to show the room from this angle, not just to switch up the view from all the panels of it in chapter five, but also to show how the trough around the outside of the room allows the glass to be lit by lamp oil. The matriarch glass was inspired by saint windows in Christ Church in Dublin. The 11 matriarchs shown were either pulled from something existing, like a legend story or earlier mouse guard book references, or created to embody some specific specialty that matriarch brought to the guard. Much like the saints in those windows, each have an area of study that they are known for being the saint of. Faroon was from Jeremy Bastion's Legends of the Guard story and is rumored to be the first ever matriarch. Diana, I created her for this volume, uh, a mouse of botanical study. Diana is a family name in Julia's family. I later referenced her in the Legends of the Guard volume two hardcover legend about the quail cart. 
Laria, was mentioned already both in Fall and in Legends Volume 1 as being the fourth matriarch. I thought that the reason she may have been the earliest certain known matriarch from that Legends cover story was that she was the one who expanded Lockhaven, and that that expansion may have been uh, what was considered to be a rebirth of the Guard, or a new zero point. Siobhan. She was created just for this book. The name came to mind because of seeing it on American Idol back in 2010 when one of the contestants, Siobhan Magnus, made it pretty far in the competition. I liked the name, I thought it felt old world, and used it for this healer. Allison. I think was originally written about in the RPG where there's a quote attributed to her, but beyond that, I think I basically just created her here as a writer and a thinker. Moira is from Mark Smiley's Legends of the Guard story from Volume 1, where a mouse who is the object of lust for a cruel and manipulative king ends up slaying him and donning her fallen beloved's armor. The story concludes that she became a guard mouse. I wanted her to be more than that and to become a matriarch too. She is also the subject of my limited 11 by 11 inch print titled Rose. Adele was purely a creation for this book, I figured the beekeepers needed to start with some mouse, and why not it be a matriarch? Part of me wants to say her name was inspired by the singer Adele, but I don't know if she was on my radar yet when I was drawing this book. Reina was also created for this book, and music felt like a pursuit worthy of a saint, or matriarch. I think her name was inspired by the character from Craig Thompson's graphic novel, Blankets. Kaylin was an invention for this book, the patron matriarch saint of cartography. Doris is an homage to my paternal grandmother, who was an amazing cook and baker. Her favorite color was purple, so that's this matriarch's cloak color. My grandmother was a giver of kindness and love through food and nourishment. A matriarch if there ever was one. Vega was inspired by the elaborate collars and dresses shown in portraiture of Queen Elizabeth I, but she's an invention for this book. One who has lots of star patterns on her clothes as the patron matriarch of celestial navigation. And that's the hardcover extras for Mouse Guard the Black Axe. The hardcover is published by Archaea. If you've enjoyed this commentary, please leave comments in the section below, let me know what I didn't answer for you in this volume, and subscribe for updates when I add more Mouse Guard commentary. Thank you for listening.